Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of art, politics, social justice, film, theater, and of course, music. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with hip hop legends, RZA, Inspector Deck, Jizza, You God, and Cappadonna from Wu-Tang Clan, and filmmaker. <laughs> And, of course, a filmmaker, writer, and musician, Sasha Jenkins. They were apostles of hip-hop culture, fans of kung fu cinema, members of the 5% nation. They were survivors, brilliant kids with absolutely no social capital. Then they cut a song, Protect Your Neck, and the world hasn't been the same since. Tonight, we will discuss Showtime's documentary series, Wu-Tang Clan of Mikes and Men, which features interviews with the group's nine living members, as well as never before seen footage and archival concert video. Moderating tonight's conversation is Dodai Stewart, the deputy editor for the Metro section of the New York Times. She was one of the founding editors of Jezebel, a senior editor at Fusion Music Group, Media Group, and editor-in-chief of Splinter. So I thought tonight we would deviate from the regular tepid clap welcome for the New York Times Times Talks and put up a special woo welcome. Let's give it up for Dodi Stewart, Sasha Jenkins, You God, Cappadonna, Inspector Deck, Jizza, and the RZA. <laughs> yeah, looks nice out. What's up? What's up? Peace. Zuka, zuka, zuka. So, great hometown crowd, you can tell. <laughs> New York. So, can I get a so? Uh, I would love to just jump right in and ask Sasha, like, how, how, what, how did this happen? Well, magic. I, I've been magic, yeah. Um, I've been a journalist for many years, and I actually, you know, I used to publish a hip hop newspaper called Beatdown, and we were the first publication to put them on the cover of anything. So my career kind of is in sync with their careers. Um, but I've been producing film and television, directing for some years. Myself and RZA have the same agent, and my agent said, "Hey, RZA and the Wu are finally ready to tell their story. Do you want to put your hat in the ring?" I said, "Of course." Uh, he is based in Los Angeles. I'm based in New York. I flew to L.A. for the day just to meet with him, got off the meeting and got back on the plane. And um, we had a great conversation. And he told me that he was looking at a lot of big budgeted, big name because, you know, he is Hollywood these days. A round of applause for him transitioning into Hollywood. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But I told him, yo, man, I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? This ain't Hollywood. I understand this. And he marinated on it for a week, and then he recently told me that his lovely wife was the one who said, give the brother a job, so I want to shout his wife out again. So here we are. Um, I'm wondering what was the most difficult thing while you were pulling everything together for the film. You have archival footage, you have interviews with everyone, and uh, what was the hardest thing for you? And then I also want to know what was the hardest for the, pe for the subjects. Well, these men are all on the go all over the world, living all over the place, traveling, making art, expressing themselves. So getting them together, um, it can be challenging. But when I got with them individually, as when you will see the film, the, they were very open in our conversations. I didn't think they were interviews. It felt more like conversations. And um, how we sort of compensated for that challenge was I had the idea to put everyone in a movie theater and show them uh, images from their lives and their career. And um, I knew that just the, the, having the ability to see their relationship, just the information in the body language alone when you see these guys together in a the theater helps you understand the magic. You can't just put nine black men in a theater and expect the same energy is gonna happen. There's something special about the combination of all those guys. So, it wound up being a pretty powerful device, and I look like I'm really something special, but really it came out of the necessity to find a creative way to work with everyone's challenging schedules. What do you think was the most difficult part? I think one of the most difficult parts was actually opening up and telling 
certain parts of our story and certain parts of my life, which, you know, men seem, you know, we bottle things in, you know what I mean? Uh, this documentary actually visits some, some glorious times, some fun times, but also some dark times. And um, Sasha basically, I know for me, maybe the rest of the brothers can echo this, uh, he became like that therapist, <laughs> you know what I mean? And he would ask me, you know, questions, and you sit there, call you back, another, yo, come back, we got it, you know. And and he has a he has you know, being that he's someone who lived hip hop, a New Yorker, a musician in his own right, and writer, I think that um, he commands the comfortability from 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 me. I think from the rest of us, as I watched even Ghostface say things I I didn't know about Ghostface, and so, but it was very difficult to accept the point in life that you shed your skin and share your story. Anybody else want to weigh in on what they've found difficult about it? I, I agree with what he said. It's hard to really, you know, a lot of people don't know our story, so to let out some of those personal moments, you know, it's kind of crazy. And then to see it on screen play back to you, it hits you even, you know, it hits you 10 times, so. I mean, I, I enjoyed it personally. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. This Capadonna right here, <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, but you you know, living it, what was uh, circumstantial to me, you know, that, that was the, the hardest part. And, you know, just to being able to, to capture that and to have all of those memories, you know, that, that research, that deep research that he found our childhood and was able to bottle that like that. Like, cause I'm, I'm not really one to be expressing myself all the time. I, I, I keep a lot bottled in. So, you know, that movie gave me a chance to, for everybody to get a chance to see who I am, how I was getting down in the hood and, and what made me the man I am today. Um, this brings me to a really good part, which is uh, talking about the beginning before Wu-Tang ever released anything. Um, obviously some of you are related, and but also something that you had in common was a kind of hustler mentality, um, and we have a clip that shows that. You know, I think New York is like the, a mecca of entrepreneurs. Sometimes we'd be at the highway selling the newspapers. We sold newspapers on the Verrazano Bridge. Yeah, on the Verrazano. And I remember raising them, they, they had those lanes. Like, they were smart enough to know what lanes was jumping and shit. The worst thing you could get is the truck lane. Paper is going for 30 cents. They're giving you a dime off for every paper. So you get about 15 bucks a day doing that. For a welfare family, that's an important income, $15 a day. I was working in Grand Central Station as a messenger, bro. Right? packing bags at the supermarket. I used to work for uh, Transit Authority, cleaning two cars a day. My pops died when I was six, so I'm trying to take a little a little bit of the, uh, of, the, of the pressure off my mom to try to raise three kids, you know what I'm saying? Trying to make money, just hustling any way I can, so I was working, man. I went and got a job. Statue of Liberty was hiring. A lot of my friends were already working there. I started working, I loved the job. It's my first real fucking job and shit. Meth used to work full time, but I used to work on the weekends. I was a janitor. I used to take out all the garbages, clean up all the condiments, all the fucking toilets used to be nasty, the bathrooms, they used to do all type of nasty shit in there. I had to um, steam the floors out on the deck because the seagulls come in there and shit all over the goddamn place. You know the history of the Statue of Liberty? It was given to us by the French. It's supposed to be the black woman. They say it is. I don't know. Now, mind you, we worked here for years and never went to go see this woman. Never one time we went up in there. Wow. <laughs> How you How you doing? Doing? I'm good. How you been? Good, thank you. Still here. <laughs> Still here. <laughs> Let me see something. Mr. Hill was the owner of the restaurant that's on the Statue of Liberty. And he had a son, Brad. 
That is the man right there. How are you, sir? Wow. How has it? How are you? How you been? You look great, Brad. You too. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow, sir. How you doing, sir? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You doing uh, well? I'm doing well. I'm doing pretty yeah. good for myself. So you've transitioned a little bit. To a little bit. All, Adulthood. All shows, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. What are you doing? Still Wu Tang. You know, still down with Wu Tang. Staying group. Staying group. Staying group stuff. Okay. Just, you know, me and him, you know, we have his best friends, so, you know, we just ah. transition to something else, <laughs> you know. You know, I have dreams about, like, I'll, I'll be in a dream and I'm working here again. You gotta understand, for me, these, these are still moments that are just etched in my brain forever because it was a highlight of my life. Even though with the career and everything, this is still one of the highlights of my life. Best job I ever freaking had. Thank you very much. I just, I love you guys talking about that because I feel that that work ethic just transferred over into the Wu-Tang work ethic and that you were just always in the studio and, you know, building production companies. I mean, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think work is one of the most vital parts of human life, um, seriously. And I think that, you know, we all was hustling, whether we was working, like you said, from packing bags, to, to sell the newspapers to, you know, Meth became the assistant manager <laughs> all right, at the, at the fry, fry, fry guy, right? But, and, and look, and Jizza, you know, you know, working for Transit, riding bike messengers. The, the thing I think that is important about that, you know, according to the biblical story, when Adam is kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the first commandment was, you shall work to the sweat of your eyebrow. And I, I know for a fact that putting work in brings out or yields a great reward. And, and having it, you know, you know, instilled in us in young ages by necessity, right? It was a necessity, like he said, he's inspected deck is trying to help out with his father's absence. Most of our fathers are absent. And the ones who did have fathers, it's still, the economics still wasn't enough to get those pair of Adidas you wanted. You're not going to get that, you know what I mean? So, so we, we, we found ways and we was willing to work, you know? And I think for, um, you know, for, for young people, you know, in America, that that's maybe an element that's starting to slag. We're starting to maybe slack and just the, like, maybe you be embarrassed to sit on, on 125th just selling apples and oranges. But me and Dirty, we wasn't embarrassed to do that because at the end of the week, we didn't have to ask nobody for nothing. You know what I mean? Um, and that ethic stayed with me to this day, y'all. Yeah, I, I, was a, I was a stone cold hustler. You know, I'll tell you the truth. I would get up five o'clock in the morning to catch the fiends rushing. You know, it was real for me because I was a different type of dude. And if you wasn't getting up early to hustle, you wasn't really hustling it back there in them days, you know what I mean? After I got fired from that job, because I was working with there for a long time, I still had the work ethic, you know? Get up early in the morning, eat your, you know, eat your little bagel and that, and you get it in. You know, you work all through the day, whatever you was doing, you just do, you put your work into it. If you know, all y'all gonna have to go through that. You know what I mean? Y'all gonna have to do some type of work in this world, and I hope y'all just got a good positive focus on what y'all wanna do, that's all. The ill part about it to me is like, we ain't had no jobs. We ain't had the, the appropriate paperwork, the ID. I probably didn't get no ID till I was like 25 or something. You know what I'm saying? Driver's license at 30 and all of that. So we wasn't qualified. So the magic of the whole job situation is that we was creating jobs from nothing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yo, packing bags, selling belts. We were selling whatever we can get our hands on, newspapers and all of that, you know what I'm saying? But at the same time, that's the same energy that helped us produce our rap. We ain't know it was gonna really be a business like that. We was just doing it, it was a hobby at first. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, yo, since we started incorporating it and took something and made it from nothing again, boom, there it is. Jobs for everybody now, we can hire somebody.
let me let me weigh in on that. Um, for me, it was it was kind of different, you know. The whole thing about hustling, this hustling thing, or working, as we call it, is something that was instilled in us since we were younger. You know, when you have, especially when you have parents that work. My father used to drive a truck, and sometimes I would work, but I would go out with him during the summer and see him do his thing and work. So it gives you this sort of um, inspiration to want to work and make your own money. Like he said, we was we was. Um, at an early age, we was packing bags. We were shoveling snow. When it started snowing, we would go shovel snow. We were, as we got older, because, you know, when I first started working, jobs was falling out in the sky. Around that time, there were plenty of jobs, you know, and I started at a, as a teenager. But when, when, at a time when we couldn't get jobs, we would go out and hustle on our own, sell socks, selling shirts, selling hats. When we were younger, we used to buy candy and sell it for double the price. So if it was penny candy, we were selling it for two cents. So this hustling thing was just something that was instilled in us from a young age. Do you ever think about what you might be doing if you hadn't done music? <laughs> Try not to think about that. <laughs> Try not to. I, I, I used to have those like nightmares. It wasn't even thoughts. It was like, because you, you see where we come from, and it's like, it's, it's only, it's like death or jail. You know, you can, you can choose your own choice. I wanted to go to, um, I had applied for um, uh, 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 the, the school for the, uh, the music. I wanted to be on a radio station. I wanted to be a voice for the radio. So I was going to try to go to like one of these community colleges or somewhere to get a trade for it. And, um, you know, RZA gave me the call right around the right time. I had court cases. I had cops on my ass, you know, <laughs> bills to be paid. So everything happened like perfect timing for me. It was like you want to turn your back. You don't want to be running from the cops. You don't want to be selling drugs to your people. I had an aunt that died. Um, you know, my aunt and my uncle died from drug overdoses and things like that. So that's when I decided I didn't want to sell drugs anymore. You know what I mean? And then, you know, the phone call from RZA came right on time. Like, yo, we doing this, this album. You got some rhymes. Come down to my house. And it's like, what am I going to do? Not go to his house and <laughs> run into the local officer again? So, you know, I, I took a chance and went down to his house. And that's how my life changed, you know? Also, there's no telling of what we would have been doing now as adults if we didn't make it in the music industry. Because as a child, your ideas always change. When you're younger, you may want to be a policeman. Then you want to be a doctor. You may want to be a, a pilot. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I was in high school, I, I thought about playing basketball until I tried out for the team. <laughs> then I knew that wouldn't work because I was tired mm -hmm. <laughs> from running up and down on the court. But one thing I, I, I may say is that even if we didn't make it as professionals in the music industry, no matter what profession I would have been dealing with or doing, I would have still been writing rhymes or writing stories because this was a passion that we had before we were doing it professionally. So. Even if I would have been a pilot or a truck driver, I would have still been writing. Um, I want to talk about your early experience with record labels. Um, you had a quote saying that um, Tommy Boyd signed House of Pain over Wu-Tang. Over Wu-Tang, yeah. Because um, you had uh, experience being the Pr Prince Rakim days. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if you like thought about what would happen if you had signed with Tommy Boy instead of starting your own, you know, production company, managed company. Well, in all reality, um, um, out of necessity, like, you know, once again, and self-reliance had to come and m merge. I think if I would have, if Tommy Boy would have got a hold of Wu-Tang um, in that phase when I was attempting to uh, pitch it to them, yeah, I think the outcome would have been different because Nobody understands you like you. One thing that helped make us work is that it was nobody to answer to. There's nobody that come to tell us, yo, you know, how are you going to make a song called Protect Your Neck? There ain't no hook. <laughs> how you make a record with no hook, right? Um, and then come back later when you are the multi-platinum artist, the radio station is waiting, the record stores are waiting, they ship in two million units at $25 a piece, and your single is Triumph, 
a song with no hook. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but that's what made Woo what it is. Being able to have creative freedom. And I think, uh, and I respect uh, Tom Silverman. He gave me my first record deal. I was 18 with a record deal, right? So that's a blessing. Just a, um, a cold chilling records, you know what I mean? Uh, that's a blessing. But at the end of the day, though, uh, for the identity of what we are and what we were supposed to bring to the world, it was only one way to enter with that, and that was through self-entry. Um, for Sasha, I'm just wondering, I feel that um, through the episodes, the two things that are intertwined are love and money. These men have a lot of love for each other, love for the music, but there's always like this economic, you know, in the background. And what was your, you know, thought process around including all the economics from their early jobs to how the Wu management was set up? Slavery. That's a good answer. Um, you know, as someone who grew up in a, in a similar environment, you know, when RZA talks about, um, you know, he had to switch his clothes with his brother, right? If you're from the hood, you know that Easter, you got to get fly, right? And when, when I, where I grew up, a lot of kids couldn't afford that, so they sold drugs. And, you know, in 1986, I know guys who were my age who were getting, you know, five, three thousand dollars a day. They could get fresh, right? Why do we want to get fresh? Then you go back to the idea of Sunday best. Do people here know the term Sunday best and what it means? Someone tell me what Sunday best means. Go to church and look nice, right? But did you know that it comes from uh, there were certain states in the South that made it a law that slave masters had to buy their slaves nice outfits so they can go worship a God that was completely foreign to them. So when you think about that, right, we don't think about that. I wasn't thinking about that when I was growing up with hip hop. I was one of these kids who wanted to look fresh. My moms could only afford but so much. You know, so economics, this is America. That's the other thing. Like everything that they just told you about their hustle, no one ever, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but we are all in the habit of like, no one questions little Billy with his lemonade stand about his hustle, right? We question ourselves about these things, but like, these guys are Americans. You know, when, when the film opens up and you learn that there's a pond behind their projects, like I had the East River, I didn't have a pond, right? But there's two ponds. There's the pond that they played in and there is the white pond. Right? So the film starts out with these kinds of ideas of innocence. We're selling newspapers. We're packing bags, right? We have that hustle. Capadon is telling you that that same energy translated into their work ethic. Riz is telling you, like, you know, uh, being able, the ability to work is like one of the highest honors as a human being, right? We have that. But the idea that's put out there is that we don't have that. The idea is that we're lazy. The idea is that we want to sell drugs. These guys didn't want to sell drugs. The guys that I grew up with didn't want to sell drugs. But there was no social capital. But what Wu-Tang represents and what hip-hop represents is cultural capital. And these guys were smart enough to understand that they had the cultural capital that could take them from Staten Island, and we all know if you're from New York, you know nothing about Staten Island, and you know <laughs> nothing about the projects in Staten Island. These guys, largely from the projects in Staten Island, have created something that doesn't just represent music. Wu-Tang represents identity, and that's what hip-hop is. You know, and bringing it back to slavery, the idea of my last name is Jenkins, that does not come from Africa. But if you're a graffiti artist or an MC, you rename yourself something. And the power of, of having control over your identity is the power of what hip hop really represents. And they are the epitome of the full real, realization of hip hop. And yes, when we were doing it, we were just kids on the street expressing ourselves, not thinking about money. That's why they are the purest representation. They are the last real hip hop group because they were a part of the culture when it wasn't about money. It was about being a kid and trying to find something to occupy our minds and our creativity because there was nothing for us. So that's where now these guys had a vision and they stuck with it. And then all of a sudden there's an industry that's growing and they're like, we want in. And RZA says, you want in? And there's a quote in the film from an early interview that they did with a Brooklyn college student where he said, I'm not going to be somebody's son. 
These record companies are going to treat us like sons. We're not going to be that. And here we are today. Um, this actually lines up with the next clip that I wanted to play, which, which is just about the um, economics and how you made it not just a group but a company. Whatever I did was the foundation to create Wu-Tang. They came to my house to make the music. Okay, RZA's my little brother. So RZA's like, okay, I'm gonna make all the music, you're gonna run the business. And I go start the company. And then I got my first Macintosh. And I was like, what the fuck do you do with a computer? And within a month or two, I had QuickBooks in there, Peachtree, which is all basically a bunch of software for accounting purposes, because I'm managing the group. And I eventually just got good at it. That nigga right there, check it out, he, he missed the spark and shit. If this was Star Trek, he'd be Spock. That's highly illogical, Captain. What I'm saying? They be trying to bulk and mind melt, motherfuckers and shit. Before I knew it, I was reading all the contracts. I was negotiating all the deals. Eight, nine, ten. Everybody's lives changed. Everyone had a place to live. Everyone had a set of wheels. <laughs> Wu-Tang Productions started getting big. We were just expanding as a company. We started the first business, Wu-Tang Production. Wu-Tang Management, Wu-Tang Publishing, Wu-Tang Records, Razor Sharp Records. These are, every two years, me and RZA are starting a new venture. You know, we cross-pollinated the music with the fashion. We used to sell T-shirts at the shows, and they was going so fast. Just this logo alone sells. Like, man, you put two and two together, let's open up a store. Now it's my time, Agent Wu Wear, Kappa Fleece Wear. Wu Tang Clan is Wu Wear, Wu Wear is Wu Tang Clan. Anytime, anywhere, you know what I mean? The best this year, Wu Wear and Fleece Wear. We didn't even know if that shit was gonna work. I started Wu Wear from the mail order and the back of Raekwon's album. I wanted to be in Macy's. Music isn't the only industry the Wu Tang Clan is making noise in. It seems everything the group touches turns to gold. In its first year, the Victory Boulevard store grossed $5 million. Now the clothing line is all over the country, with stores in Virginia, Georgia, and California. You can even find Wu Wear in Macy's. Our main money maker was the music, then the touring, then the brand. Probably one of our biggest years was like 25 million as a whole, 25, 30 million. Um, I'm wondering if your ideas of of money in that way have changed through the years, or how they have changed from your, you know, selling papers into becoming successful. If I would uh, speak on it first, the crazy thing for me is um, money has always just been a tool, like it's never been like my drive. It, I didn't start thinking about money till maybe like five years ago. <laughs> no, because, because in all reality, when you're building, right, the materials that you gain from building, you put back in to continue building. And when you see, um, you, know, as you, you know, in that clip right there, it was one store, two, and now you're up to five stores, right? So you're not taking the money and just going in. And, and buying a car or, or, or buying a home. You take care of your basic necessities, which we, you know, our 12 jewels of life, right? We take care of that first, but it was always to reinvest. Jizza said something in the lyric. He said, Bobby said, what, don't spend 50 on a whip. Buy a quip. The flip, got a thousand tracks stored on the chip. Yeah, so, when, I, so when, I, when, when the money came in, it wasn't like, yo, let's go get the Bentley. It was like, yo, let's go, go get the SSL, which is a mixing board to make better songs, you know what I mean? So, so, so for, growth, for, for growth and development, it wasn't just about the hustle of money. Once, once, once we took care of our basic necessities, um, it became more about how do we build a major corporation out of this. I want to point out one thing that uh, Snoop Dogg said to, to me and my brother one day, you know, because we have a similar trajectory, actually. 
you know, him and the dog pound the cousins, you know, me, Jizza, and Dirty as cousins. Uh, a lot of the other homies as friends since high school. Uh, all of us here know each other the, at least from 12, 13, 14 years old. And some of my mothers knew each other. So that's, this is a family and it's a community. Um, but he pointed out something that was cool for me to hear him say. He was like, yeah, Rizzo, you was on some Mozart shit, but your brother was a Fortune 500 company CEO with a hood education. You know what I mean? And when you go back and you look at all these corporations that he's starting, right? And he, it wasn't only just Wu-Tang Records and Razor Sharp. He started Method Man Entertainment. You know what I mean? He started Tony Stark's Enterprises. Uh, he started your company as well, right, Just? Donna Donna. He started Capadonna's company. So he kept building companies for us, you know what I mean? Giving us, you know, at least giving us that s spark, you know what I mean? That now takes us to put more wood on that fire to keep it burning. But he was very intuitive with, intuitive with that. And, and, um, and so just one other thing to add, you know, it takes a village. It took a village too, right? So you, you're looking at the talent and the struggle of us but when you see other guys in our uh, documentary, whether it's Mike McDonald, who's a guy from the Bronx that was good at record promotions that came and, 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 and joined our team, whether it was uh, John Moot Gibbons, who was a bus driver, right? <laughs> who, uh, he quit his job and came and tried to sell records with us. Uh, my brother, Devon, you know what I mean? Who, um, once again, he, he learned his education from after being locked up, they put him in a program and he, use the program like he didn't go to the program and come back out and go backwards he gained gained this GED from that program and kept building uh power you know Oliver Grant you know another dude who dropped out of high school but he had a 12.9 reading level in the sixth grade <laughs> right so it so it's, so we had a lot of good people around us as well um that that's not popular and um as a as artists that helped this grow and so how I feel about money now, though, <laughs> is that, yo, you got to you gotta have it. You know, Deck and, and Raekwon, <laughs> you got to have it. We live in a capitalist, a capitalist society. I tell my children this. I say, listen, this ain't no utopia. You just can't go out there and grab a mango off the tree. You just can't go out there and, and get a sandwich. This is a place where you have to buy and you have to earn. And so I teach them that. But I will say this. Deck and Raekwon made uh, with Rolling Stone has said is maybe in, in the, the number 11 or 10th greatest hip hop song of all times. And it's called Cream. Cash rule everything around me. But the lesson of that is it rules everything around, around me, you. but That's it don't you. rule me. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I'd like to go back to <clears throat> December 1992. Um, these were the top 10 songs in the country. Number 10, End of the Road, Boys to Men. Number nine, What About Your Friends, TLC. Number eight, Good Enough, Bobby Brown. Number seven, Real Love, Mary J. Number six, Rhythm as a Dancer, Snap. <laughs> Remember that. <laughs> Number five, I'd Die Without You, PM Dawn. Wow. <laughs> Number four, how do you talk to an angel, the heights? <laughs> Number three, rump shaker, Rex in effect. <laughs> Number two, if I ever fall in love by Shy. Ah, yeah. Jeez. And number one, which had been number one for like, I don't know, uh, so long, was I Will Always Love You by Whitney. Yeah. Um, and so into that environment was... <laughs> How was when Protect Your Neck was dropped? It was dropped uh, December 14th, 1992. Um, it's not like that stuff that's on the. <laughs> like, I'm, gonna let the I'm, I'm gonna let my brothers take it, but I just wanna say now I see why that executive was like, it'll never sell. <laughs> yeah, remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will, yeah I'd love to just like talk about that and also like if you could describe the video because looking back, it's amazing. Yeah. Just to give a quick, from my point of view, like Wizard was saying, I was going to those offices with him, getting denied, like getting doors closed in our face because like he said, yo, there's nine of y'all on there and there's no hook. Um, you know, we, we gotta go get a feature on there. Somebody's gotta sing and this, that, and the third. And we like, ah, oh, that's, that's R&B, that's happy rap. And you know, going crazy. 
you know. But um, I knew from the jump, man, like our, song, our sound was different. It didn't fit in. It didn't belong with that. And that's why I liked it so much. When you go down the Rizzo house, you would hear a beat or something that you would, you never heard that before. I don't care who your favorite MC or artist was. He would play something that was like totally from scratch. He got spoons banging on glass for sounds, you know what I mean? Like before samples and all that. So it's just crazy, man. I remember being the mix of all of that. We came out, nobody really knew about us. We had masks on on the album cover. Uh, some of us wasn't even there. We had replacements, stand-ins, you know? And um, we traveled around the world with, like you said, Mook Gibbons and, you know, selling out the trunk and forcing our way up on shows and radio stations and things like that. I mean, they had a show called, um, you know, How Can I Be Down, Jack the Rapper, The Gavin, things like that. And I remember we had to take microphones from Run DMC, man, <laughs> in order for us to get on the stage because they, they didn't want no part of these nine karate chop sample guys, you know? <laughs> and, um, and then they showed love and let us get it. But, you know, to get to the point, like, you know, we didn't, we didn't belong. We were the outcasts, and it sounded like that. And I think that's what made us, like, stand out amongst all of that stuff, you know? Yeah, that's probably, I guess, the mutants of X-Men, <laughs> yeah. right? But also, weirdly, right, we didn't want to belong, you know? In a weird way, um, we wanted hip-hop. We wanted what we did and what we, what we felt. We wanted that to be on the radio, or we wanted that to be a, a variable. I do think, you know, 1986, uh, if you maybe if you pulled that chart out, man, I, I wonder what's on that uh, top ten list. But when you think about Eric B and Rakim, you think about KRS One, the entry of Big Daddy Kane, uh, the Marley Mall production uh, towards the end of MC Shan, um, Slick Rick. Um, um, you know, you know, chill, Rob. Chill, um, you know, it takes two. Chill, Rob G and them, whatever. The chill, Rob, Rob G is uh, Rob, Rob Bass. Yeah, Rob Bass. Yeah. Chill, Rob G is uh, which one was that? He had a, he had a joint. Snap, out that time. snap, yeah, snap, snap, something too. like that. Yeah. Oh, he was on the list, right? <laughs> <laughs> that, was snap. that was snap version. Snap. Yeah. Well, anyway, being what I'm saying is that a lot of hip hop was it had a moment where. It sounded like hip hop, yeah. and then it stopped sounding like hip hop. It started sounding like R and B. It started, you know, we love Teddy Riley; he's a friend of ours. Uh, but Wrecking Effect is an R and B group doing hip hop. You know what I mean? We love New Edition, uh, but New Edition they're throwing rhymes in the middle of R and B, right? We are the MCs. We are the guys that when you that's in your hood, in your neighborhood, in the staircase. That's the boom, boom, bop on the wall. You know what I mean? They're making songs and, and, and recording that energy. And so we was, we, we was comfortable being different from that. And one part of me, and it took a long time for me to gain this, and I, uh, I think we talked about this with my brothers, um, at one point, and maybe because I was young, maybe because I was kind of got rejected a little bit from the label, but I hated R&B. I hated, like, I hated things that, wasn't like reflective of, of my community, to, what, what I thought was, you know what I mean? And it took me years, uh, you know, to kind of like start listening back to, you know, Joe and, <laughs> and all those guys and shit like that. But uh, <laughs> it just took me a long time to play R&B in my own house, yo. It's crazy. <laughs> um, but also, we got to realize also that Curtis Blow was an MC that was rapping off R&B also. So it's like a vice versa thing. Sugar Hill Gang was a rap group that was rapping off R&B. So it's just what goes around comes around, you know? It's just changed as years went on. Um, I do want to talk about the video for Protect Your Neck though, because you have, Sasha, you have footage in the film of, uh, is it Ralph McDaniels like going down in the basement to find the yes. tape? Yeah, can you just talk a little bit about that? Of, like. First of all, his basement. Well, for those of you, of you who don't know, Ralph McDaniels and Video Music Box, if you grew up in New York. Yeah, well, hey. hey. Um, for many of us who are latchkey kids, which is pretty much everyone on the stage, um, you went home at 3.30 or whatever, and you tuned in to the latest video. Like, speaking of House of Pain, there was a, before Everlast was in 
House of Pain, he was just Everlast. And, you know, when his video debuted, the next day the talk was like, did you see that white boy who sounds like Rakim? Like, <laughs> that's what went around. So Ralph McDaniels, um, not only did he have this, uh, it's the longest running video show in the world, um, he wound up producing music videos and stuff like that. Um, and so he actually has a crazy archive in his basement. When you see the film, it's his basement. And we're hoping that the film will help bring attention to his collection needing attention. But, you know, Ralph is sitting on all kinds of things, including a film that RZA did with that no one's ever seen that was shot, <laughs> Kung Fu and mobsters, you know what I mean? So, yeah. So Ralph McDaniels is just a keeper of, of hip hop knowledge and his archive is, is amazing. And, um, you know, having the privilege of going down in his basement and him pulling out the the three quarter inch, you know, which is a format many of you probably don't know, it's a big ass, tape um, that was the video that RZA handed him to play. And it wasn't, you know, in true RZA form, like it still had the time code on it. You know, it wasn't perfect. And Ralph was like, you sure you want to play this? He's like, yeah, go ahead. Um, yo, yo, Ralph, hold up. Yeah. Let me say one thing about that video. <laughs> <laughs> There's missing footage on the end of it, though. Uh -huh. Duke, I don't, I don't know what happened. He did some sucker shit. And they got pictures of us beating his ass and he was running up out of town and the, and the camera was catching him running and it's more to the video. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still more footage like of some crazy know. shit. Like but the uh, director's cut? Well, along. yeah. Well, no, the director is the guy that was running. <laughs> <laughs> we exactly. filmed his ass. You no, know what? We was, we was young and shit, right? But we was wild. We was, <laughs> we was some wild motherfuckers, man. It took a long time. That video took about three weeks to shoot, wow. right? Because... Uh, first of all, we didn't have enough money. We, we spent about 12 G's, right? And 12 G's, you know, it was, it was, a, it was a chunk of money to, to, to spend, but we took the risk and we said we we're going to do it. But the director, he, said, he just kept coming with a different camera, right? The cameras got smaller and smaller. To, remember, to, it was just a handy cam. Like, all right, on this scene right here. And then I think um, when we shot you down near the near the, um, the you shot us by down by the water. Yeah, by the water. I, I, just, I just came out the penitentiary. Yeah, so he was locked up. So we so we was like, he's gonna be home soon. He come home. We gonna get him. We gonna get him. We gonna get everybody in this video. And we well, that was the last time we that shot down last there. Last time, right there on the rocks. Next thing you know, I think Ghost might have stole on him. <laughs> <laughs> and the camera was on the floor, and it was dangling, and it caught him running, and, and we chasing after him down the block. And I, I don't even know what's going on. No, because, you know, he kept, he kept lying to us. He kept, you know, he, just, he always had some type of excuse why something was wasn't. He was using the money to buy a camera. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was using the money to buy a camera. You, know, <laughs> you might be right. I remember that. But That's in the funny. end of it all, right, we was able to get into an editing bay. And um, one, one cool thing was that, you know, I didn't even know what editing was, like, right? But um, I don't know, just, I guess it was a, a natural thing in my head. And even Ray Kwan, because he also would spend a lot of time in the editing room, editing room with me like that. He, he did that on a lot of our videos. He was also a guy that would come in and he'd sit there. And of course, Jizza is the first one of us who actually became a video director. But the cool thing was that we just kept knowing, like, chop it this way, chop it that way, chop it here, chop it here, you know what I mean? And the, the footage with the time code for me was like, yo, it looked kind of cool to me, right? <laughs> Look, like, it looks different. <laughs> and so we, and we took it to Ralph McDaniels and uh, um, he, you know, he, he played it. Ralph was also, um, he's, he's such an important part of hip hop. Uh, he's such a good dude. Um, he had met uh, us, he did Jizz's first video. Ralph did the first video that Jizz ever did called Come Do Me. Uh, th what, come do Speaking me? of R&B. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Funny. I know, it sounds funny, right? <laughs> and, and, you know, so, funny, yo, his first video was Come Do Me, right? And Hype is just, Hype Williams, he, all he does is drive the truck for Ralph. He's just a truck driver. Um, he was your driver. Look at that. You know what I mean? Hype Williams, and then he becomes Hype Williams. But what happened was um, Ralph did that video. He kind of... Had, he, he believed in us as artists, you know what I mean? And so when we brought it to him, he was like, I, I, yeah, I remember you guys uh, from the Come Do Me video from the Prince Rock King thing. And one thing I think he liked me for was when he did the Come Do Me video, 
I actually have one small scene in it. Me and Raekwon are in his video, and all you see is my arm. Right? But I stayed there for 12 hours for that shot. And it was cold. And it was cold. You remember that? Because you had the girl. You got the girl on the thing. <laughs> we sitting there like this, just waiting. But the beauty of it is that I think he recognized the tenacity of me. You know what I mean? And when I came in, I was like, yo, Ralph, yo, yo. And he, and he oh, played it. Oh, painters. Yeah, we were trying to be painted, cool. yeah, peeking in on you. But he played it, and yeah. he said that, um, you know, he got a lot of calls, and uh, it began, it began. It was a, a log on that fire, yo. Right. I have a quick City College Wu-Tang story. So for those who don't know, I actually attended City College. Um, thank you. I didn't receive a degree, so if anyone wants to hook me up, I will take one. So... Uh, are you guys familiar with an album, uh, Wu-Tang, 36? You guys know that album, right? <laughs> so do you guys know the skit where the guy says, you know what I want to hear, right? And he says, Wu-Tang, again and again. Well, there was a guy named Lamel Watson, and his radio show was here at City College. And I was cutting class, sitting in <laughs> Lamel's radio show, and I was there when that call came through. So City College is a part of Wu-Tang history, guys. Give it up for City College. Um, I do want to talk just a little bit about ODB, and um, there are a lot of vintage clips that you unearthed, and it's kind of amazing seeing as how uh, this was a time that not everybody had cell phone video, and there, you know, you found footage, so much good footage. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, your challenge in making sure that he's a, a fully formed character in this documentary, which he is, you know, that everybody gets. Um, time and he's part of that and just w the challenge for you and how you found the footage and well we had a fantastic archival team who made friends and relationships with friends and family of the group folks like Ralph McDaniels uh, were really instrumental as well but you know it was the time when these guys are rappers like they had video cam someone in the crew had a camcorder yeah. um, and a lot of this stuff people aren't looking at, and they're just sitting on these tapes. So it's like, hey, Mike McDonald, what do you have in your storage unit? And in his storage unit, he had all of the stuff that he had been sitting on. So I think a lot of us forget that many of us had video cameras during that time. And then over 25 years, I'd made so many performances, appearances overseas. You know, we got some really great um, footage, MTV footage uh, of them in Japan really early on. And you kind of see like their global appeal early on. and. You know, it's a really innocent, sweet time. If you, if you can say that about Wu-Tang, a sweet time. <laughs> and I think you can. I think watching this film, you can say that. Yeah, yeah. and w yeah, what about just uh, you guys performing with his son? How has that been? Spooky sometimes. If you, if you look at him, he looks just like him. And what's crazy about that, he, he looks like him at that age when he was with us. You know what I'm saying? So Young Dirt's about 25, 26 now, and, you know, Dirt at that age, it's, it's like looking in the mirror at him. Like, I, I bug out after it. I took a picture with him recently just to, like, you know, you look just like your father, bro. Come here. Like, you know, just, just take this picture. I'm going to frame this. And uh, it's crazy. But he got that energy. He, he's a spitting image. Um, okay. I have one last clip that I want to show, um, and then we're going to uh, open it up to some questions from the audience. We always in motion. Time is the calculation of motion. So we about to stay in a constant motion. That caused time to pass. The pop is on his way out the door. It's about to die. Say so our music is hit. It's like a healing power. You know what I'm saying? We put out many different albums. This is this is the second Wu Tang Clan album, but it ain't the second chamber from Wu Tang. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
We ain't coming with the radio friendly shit. You know, if radio gonna play it, they gonna play it. If not, so be it. Uh, we could use the radio play for real because we got a message to spread. Even though we know this is entertainment, but at the same time, this is our life right here. This is our livelihood also. And we live this shit, and we just wanna let y'all know the truth of it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's what I like about it is you're talking about how you know radio or new radio you have a message and I feel like that's part of your you know secret to longevity of still doing this when a lot of groups have fallen by the wayside and um, just if you want to talk about like what you really think that message is. I mean, look, you know probably don't have enough time to, to give the whole message, but, you know, not, look, we in Harlem, basically, you know what I mean? You know, Marcus Garvey, he came through here and he, he wanted us as black people to be noble. You know, he wanted us to, to be upright and, and righteous and, and responsible. You know what I mean? Noble Drew Ali, Malcolm X, you know what I mean? Um, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know what I mean? And for us, the father, Clarence 13X Smith, taught, you know, in these streets of Harlem, that we should have knowledge of ourselves. Know yourself, know the ledge, so you don't fall off the edge. But he, he gave these precepts of, 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 of mathematics and of the jewels of life. And those jewels of life, if, if, if man focus on those jewels of life, okay, everything else actually comes as a byproduct. So the 12 jewels is knowledge, wisdom, understanding, freedom, justice, equality, food, clothing, shelter, love, peace, and happiness, right? And those jewels are obtained kind of in a, in, a, in a linear way if you, if, you, if you was to apply it. So the first a man must have knowledge. He must know the ledge, right? He must have the, the, the knowledge so he don't fall off that edge. He knows. But once a man knows, then he could go to his wisdom. Wisdom is to speak and to show the experience of what you know. That once our knowledge and our wisdom, now I have understanding. Because understanding now means you understand what I'm talking about. You now can relate to it. Then once after that, we go to our culture. Culture is our way of life. But what is culture without freedom? Right? So we all have our culture, but are we free to express it? And what is freedom if it's not being controlled by a law of justice? Because I'm free to slap you in your face. But justice must come. Right? So that leads me to my what? Equality. And all men are created equal. That's man, that's black man, brown man, white man, red man, yellow man, woe man, because it's all man. And we are all created equal, as the Quran said, from a single cell. And then after that, what you need? You need your food, right? Not just food to eat, but the food from the tree of life for spiritual nourishment. You need clothing, not just clothes to be fresh, like he said, but a cloak of righteousness. You know what I mean? You need shelter. Not just shelter to protect you from the atmosphere of the world, but to protect you from an evil atmosphere that other people are trying to instill upon you. And once you have your, 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 your food, clothing, and shelter, life is good. Right now you need love. But what is love without peace? And if you got love and peace, you should obtain happiness. And the lesson taught us that happiness is total, complete satisfaction with yourself. Great. <clears throat> um, we'll take some questions I'm from the audience. <laughs> and uh, just a gentle reminder that a comment is not a question. <laughs> and we're gonna keep it, keep it short and sweet. There's uh, microphones here. How did I know that was coming?
Okay. Well, I think every generation, I have, I think, I have a, I have, I have a, I have a, I think I have an idea of what it is. Um, so look, I think what this film does, will sh every generation wants to be the boss. Every generation wants to feel like they're original. What Wu-Tang was talking about was what Robert Johnson was talking about. Do we know who Robert Johnson was? Yes. Okay, it's all the blues. It's not even hip hop. It's all the blues. And what these kids will see in this film is they're gonna see themselves. Because this film isn't really about Wu-Tang. It's about every black kid who came from the hood and had to go from selling newspapers to dealing with the sharks on the street selling drugs to dealing with the sharks in the music industry. That's Snoop Dogg's story. That's any hip hop story in America. Who, pe people who have transitioned from just making music for fun to being in the industry. Takashi 6 9 and all that other stuff. It's not for me. It shouldn't be for me. Um, you know, I was saying earlier, like, I grew up with Mob Deep. I love Mob Deep, but they've got songs off the infamous that are great, that I love. But, you know, at 47, I'm listening to this song, and they're telling a story about how a guy who's not from their projects had the audacity to visit his girlfriend, and he had the audacity to wear a chain, so they simply put a bullet in his head. Now, the beat is infectious. It's well put together, but it doesn't speak to me at 47. You know, so Takashi, obviously he's a bad example because he's a snitch and he's, he's, he's got to like, like he was about that life for all the, all the wrong reasons. And now he's got to like move to Sweden or something, right? So he's not going to have the opportunity as an artist to evolve. Wu-Tang themselves have evolved as men and, and artists. So we have to be open to this new generation figuring it out. And I think that these guys are a wonderful blueprint for, for that. And if they watch this film, they will see themselves. And that's what's important to me. Hopefully that answered the question. Right here. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Peace to the gods. Peace. I love Peace. Peace. Congratulations salam. on your success. I just wanted to know, I know you were working on Dark Matter. I saw you at Columbia University, and I know you got a project out. But what's next? That's it, that's it. Oh, yeah. What's next for all of us? Yeah, yeah. What's, well, you this know, documentary what are will on? come, and, uh, and we're also in the process of a scripted TV series uh, uh, with a network called Hulu, where you'll be, <laughs> able to watch, you'll be able to watch actors portray us and portray the 90s, and uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fun. So that's where a lot of our energy is going right now. OK. Thank you Thank very you. much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. We love you. You hear how he said a, ne a network, you I don't know, Hulu? You see how he said that, right? Smooth. Well, do, do you want on this yeah, the side? Peace, brothers. Um, Peace. So back in 97, I worked on an in as an intern doing the animated sequence for Wu-Tang Forever CD-ROM. I got jerked because I was an intern. But my question that I always wanted to ask y'all, <laughs> Because it's the reality. But the question I always wanted to ask was, how did y'all come up with the idea when nobody in hip hop was even thinking like that to come up with the whole CD-ROM concept long before anybody was even thinking about applying hip hop to that sort of technology? And I always wondered that. No, well, you know, being inside the buildings, you know, you get to see what's, what the future is also. That's a big privilege. That goes back to what we were saying about working and things of that nature. When you get into a, a, a corporate structure or a corporate building or colleges, you can see what the future is going to be because there's somebody who's developing that future. And then if you have a creative mind, you could look at those things and, and, and make them benefit what you're trying to do because everything already exists. So we knew from being video game guys and playing on video games and, and, and having enough economics like Devon said in that uh, comics, interview. comics. Yeah, he already, he already bought a computer. Right? He didn't know what it was, but he bought one. So that was, you know, so we knew through growth and development that that would be uh, a great outlet. Mm -hmm. And also, the industry knew. So what I mean by that is that that uh, CD-ROM he talked about, the DVD-ROM, it also gave you free access to America Online, right? Mm -hmm. So that means America Online, and we didn't know this at that particular time, that means America Online came 
loved the idea, got behind it, but put their brand in over 2 million homes in one week. In one week. By having it on that CD. So, so and, you know, here goes something funny, brother. Yeah. The man who created the internet modem, Dr. Nick, Said he created it listening to 36 Chambers. <laughs> Word up. Smoking some weed, of course, but. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Yeah, All right. <clears throat> so um, I think I heard her earlier say that one of your albums or something, or a song, dropped in 1992. I was born in 1995. So, you know, I'm kind of coming after, but as, I guess, as a young black man in America to older black men, I want to ask you all. How would I say this? As black people through history, you see that our culture was kind of taken away from us, the language and everything. And then after slavery, you have this new culture that's starting to be created, this kind of like black struggle or swag or something that the world around is eating it up. They're eating up this struggle that we're going through, the, the culture that comes out of it. So I'm trying to figure out how, for all this time, people have been eating up a product that we have but it's 2019 now. I researched in 2018, black people still have the lowest household income in America. So I'm trying to ask older black people, older black men to younger black men, like, what happened in between? How do we go from a black Wall Street to where we are now? Well, that's a great question. And, and maybe you won't get the entire answer right here, but let me give you a little insight at least, right? Mm -hmm. So we do create culture, right? Um, but we, what we don't do is create the opportunities to make economics off that culture. One thing that we don't do, you may go, you may not even accept a job to work for a black man, right? Because a white man could come with a suit and you'll believe him. You'll believe him. Another thing that we don't do and don't understand, that's what I was telling my daughter who's you know, her early 20s. I said, listen, um, don't mistake, don't mistake that our culture that we're exemplifying is our culture. Because at the end of the day, a lot of our personalities and things we do, we absorb from the people around us, right? So why, I'm just go a little bit on this. Why is he a nigga? Because the people who's raising the slave is the field hand man who's the overseer of him who's uneducated. But the educated person is inside the house. So he speaks proper diction, the, the queen's English. But the fucking motherfuckers who's out there telling you, get that shit, nigga, go nigga, nigga, and whip your ass, he can't even read his motherfucking self. So now we can't read. And so now we talk in that tone of speech. And so now, the scraps of things they give us, whether it's the pork chops or the pig feet and the pig ears and the garbage, it becomes our soul food, okay? But if you go back before this and you just go to look at the hieroglyphics and you see these beautiful people who's chilling with nice jewelry, they on nice boats and flowers and, yo, it's beautiful, the hieroglyphics. It's giving you an example of our culture. There's no hieroglyphic showing war, nor showing slavery. It shows people prospering. If we snap back into our original culture, this same light that we shine to make the world like, oh, I want to be black like James Brown, or black like Michael Jackson, or black like Michael Jordan, right? It, they'll see the pure version of being black, which is maybe not be this distorted version that we have to live out based on where, we, where we're born at. The black man in America is probably the youngest nation in the world. What I mean by that is most of these other nations could trace, trace back. We trace ourselves back to being a product, right, of slavery. A product where a man took 64 years of study before he was like, okay, I got a nigga, I got a Negro, put him to work. And now, raise, 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 generations of that. It's like, it's just like, uh, it was my last thing, brother, sorry, you asked us a serious right. question, but it's just like when you watch the Planet of the Apes. If you stay an ape, you're gonna be an ape, but when Caesar learned how to speak, 
He was like, yo, man. He started talking to them other motherfuckers, and they started no. dating. <laughs> All right? And then they was able to be even better than the men who captured them. And it's, like I said, you won't get the total answer right now, brother, but I hope this <laughs> so adds some light to you. I, what I, how, how can I get the total answer then? What is, uh, I don't know. Listen, go back and study Marcus Garvey. Okay. You know what I mean? Go back and study Noble Drew Ali, All right. right? And if you get a chance, you know, you're in college right now, right? And also it's online. You can just go online and look at the, look at, look at, look at, yo, don't take nothing that you're being told on face value. Don't think that the pyramids and the Egyptians who did that only did that 5,000 years ago. I, I, the thing with me is that right now I'm actually like, I've heard of some of the things you're talking about and whatnot, but I'm actually trying to do computer engineering right now. So mm -hmm. I think studying things from a science perspective, you have a real two plus two kind of, two plus two equals four kind of perspective on things. So after everything that you just said and everything, everything we know, what are we gonna do actually now to put into action that's gonna make it to where in 2020, black people still don't have the lowest income in America? Oh, Start oh, coming said, together. Gotta, Hold I on. gotta go. Oh, you yeah, gotta go, but brother. Yeah. You see this? We are all low income high school dropouts. Okay. And we became millionaires, brother, because we came together. Come together with your All team, right. kid. All All right. Right. Thank you. On this side. How you doing, brothers? Congratulations on all your success. I'm just happy to see you guys are just still here representing. Um, congratulations. What I wanted to ask you, um, I love documentaries because it always brings you back. Um, you just get a lot of inspiration. When I, used to, you know, when I was younger, I used to watch you know, Jimi Hendrix but I wasn't of that time. I was in college when you guys were bumping. So to be in college and, you know, to kind of grow up, with, you know, listening to your music and you see all these nostalgic moments that come together in one piece, can you talk about whether it's an album, a track, a moment where you felt like everything was clicking, like the vibe was just right, you had like, the, this, as an artist, what album or track or moment that you could speak about where you was feeling like, man, this is probably, probably the moment where I felt the most sublime in my artistry on this track and this moment, the cipher, if you could talk about any of those moments that you could remember that sticks out. Maybe it was more than one. It probably happens often because as an artist, you probably have more. But maybe there was one that you remember like, this, was, this is where we was really clicking on that day. I mean, we all could say, go ahead. I was well, for me personally, I had, I, had a, I had a great moment when we was in LA. We had the Wu Mansion out there. We was working on the Eight Diagrams album. You know what I'm saying? And I used to throw, I used to throw the parties, huh? What was that, the Eight Diagrams or the Wu Forever? At the, that was forever. The first time was Wu Forever, and then the second time LA was the W. Those are two. The W, at the Wu Mansion. Yeah, because yeah, I was throwing parties over there, inviting Busta Rhymes and all of them. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that was, that was the highlight of my time, right there. You know, and, and, and we had a mansion in LA. <laughs> you know the mansion uh, throwing parties can't beat that. Yeah, bust around. Me personally, I speak for myself, man. Um, it came for me when you know, respect to Kid Capri. Um, I remember RZA gave him the the record and was like, "Yo, play this joint." He said, "Yo, I'm gonna play it for you. I'm gonna play it." And you know, we looked him in the eye like, "Yo, play the joint, man." <laughs> And uh, he said he would. And I remember being at Rizzo's house, you know, family and everybody over there, waiting, 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 just, okay, it's coming on next record. It's coming on next record. You know, another record come on, Big Daddy Kane or something to come on. All right, the next one, next one. And then it's like right when we was about to give up, like, man, he ain't playing this record, man. The record comes on. You know, it was Protect Your Neck, first time coming over the radio waves. And I remember hearing it like, you know, it was like, Yo, is that me? I'm first, so you know, it's, <laughs> it hit me like, yo, that's me, like, oh! But you know, it, it's so crazy, because you know, it wasn't even the same beat that we recorded to and things like that. RZA went and made some changes to it, so as it came through that speaker, man, it sounded like all of those dudes that we looked up to when I heard, you know, like I said, Big Daddy Kane or Coogee Rap or Bismarcky, we was coming out the radio sounding like that. Like, yo, that's dope. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and that's when it really hit me, man. And, and, you know, and, and also the, the album release for the first album at, what was it, Webster Hall or Trafalgar yeah, Square? Hall. Oh my God. You know, seeing all our peers, seeing, you know, Tribe, EPMD, and everybody that 
we love and respect came out to show us love and respect. And that's when I knew, like, yo, we, we did it. We here, you know? Um, hold, on, hold on, I'm going to say one thing, though. We was in, we did forever, we was in Hawaii. And we had that, we had that, you know, we had that little time in Hawaii, and Dirty was singing the love boat. The love boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we was, it was just one of those moments where it was just, you know, nothing but greenery and, 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 and you know, and you see, you see the, 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 the ocean was green and all that. And we had the little cars, and, and me and Ray Corn almost cl- crashed, crashed bikes and stuff together. We, we, almost, we almost killed each other on motorcycles and, yeah. and jet skis and all that. But uh, yeah, man, it was, that was a sublime moment, man. After all our hard work had paid off, that's when we, you know, that was a beautiful time. Yeah. Uh, we are out of time, but we'll take one more. Oh, man, that was fast. Oh, we got, a, we got some, some lines. What about the lady in the back of the line right there? <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Dude, like, what about me, man? <laughs> of course. Hi, I'm Janelle. Um, I'm here as a guest. Um, my dad is actually ecstasy from the group Houdini. Um, so okay. Yeah. I'm, I love I'm, some Houdini. I'm really happy to, to be here, and I'm really excited about this documentary. Um, my question was just um, really about how the digital age um, has really affected you guys um, and your own um, trajectories in your career, how that has um, allowed you to progress further um, personally um, outside of um, Mute. Uh, well, you know, oh. with digital, I'm not really, you know, a, a, a Facebook t- picture taker. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm from the era where you know, I'm still like to have mystique, but my people be telling me, you got to take more pictures for Twitter and all this other stuff. And I'm not a show off dude like that, you know? So when I take a picture, I'm like, damn, I don't, don't want to show people how I'm really living like that. So that's kind of difficult for me, you know what I mean? So, well, for uh, me, I like the gram and all that stuff. I, <laughs> I'm a playboy, you know what I'm saying? Playboy, I'm a Don, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, I got to be up on the latest fashion. I got to be up on what's going on. But, but for the most part, like, you know, rap was a hobby for us at first. You know what I'm saying? And, and I just loved to do it. And I grew up around it. And, and my brother used to always want to hear me. He came and got me. That's how I got on. He came and got me. I was working for housing. He came and got me and put me on. I ain't want to go do the shit. You know what I'm saying? But it's like... I had to beg him like three times. Like, but but, but not, it's like times. now that it's on, I feel like that computer stuff and all of that and the, and the internet, it gives me an opportunity to express more of my music. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I just put out like four albums. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> by myself, by myself. My last video is soul searching. Go check it out. It's soul searching. I got my fat stomach out. I took my shirt off and all of that. It's, and, and it's like soul searching. It's, I'm, I'm coming up out of the slavery. You know what I'm saying? I'm popping off the chain. I'm, I snapped my chain. I broke it off my neck. Like, yo, I'm coming out. And everybody get to see that now. And I'm doing it myself. It, it's like it helped me be independent. It helped me be independent. And my company is God Love Family. In that order, God Love Family. Yeah. Entertainment. But I'm still not used to this shit. <laughs> and it, and Google but, me. Hey. And to give you a summary on the business side, um, <laughs> so when digital first came out, it actually caused a big decline in the music industry. Mm-hmm. And what happened was Napster comes, right? And this is something that we, you guys be conscious of about how industries can be destroyed unintentionally. Because Napster really was just a, was a sharing platform to, for college kids to have access to a whole archive of music, millions and millions of songs. And what happened was it started to grow, like Facebook grew it, through, through college students just passing on the program, passing on the information and growing, right? But what happened with Napster that you probably don't know is that it was for free, right? Mm-hmm. But the guy who made it, they gave him a billion dollars. And if you go back and measure how much publishing that he took from the artist, it probably equates to that same billion dollars. So now the, 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 the money that was being able to be spread across the thousand successful artists, which could be a million dollars a piece, 
it comes out, it takes away their economics and now they don't have the funding to keep creating their art because it takes money to make an album. It takes money to be back in that mansion. Actual and, fact. And to be in, a, in, those, in those studios. But, so then what happened, of course, streaming services come and they couldn't find a way to monetize the digital format. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of arguments between the record label and the artists about what is digital? It's not a physical thing. So why am I only being paid as if it's a physical royalty, right? It's more of a sync, which is a different part of your contract. Only within the last three or four years, they found the way to really settle it and now monetize it. And now artists uh, are making so much money just by streaming. And so now the industry has balanced itself out again. So now digital, so at first it was our enemy, right? But that's how it is with a lot of new things. When, when cars came, horse guys, horse sellers are like, what am I gonna do with these horses? <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but it, it, it's now has, we now found the way to monetize it and the economics is coming, coming better for everybody. And one last thing of what the digital age have done, when you watch this documentary, you see us and you see all these big beat machines and us trying to make music. Now the power to create is in your pocket, yo. You, could, you have an orchestra in your pocket with GarageBand in your phone, you know what I mean? And so the power to now express yourself, you have a camera. We don't have to have that fake video director <laughs> uh, changing cameras and taking three weeks to shoot a video. You could shoot a video today. So the power of creativity and the power of expression is at its highest. You know what I mean? So enjoy it. You guys are in a great age. May life bless you, yo. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sasha, Sasha, did you want to plug your album also? Buy my album, guys. <laughs> All black punk band called the 1865. Album's called Don't Tread on We. I'm trying to follow the Wu-Tang model. You guys don't have an all-black rock band. I mean, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We're on Mass Appeal Records. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank City you, thank, thank you. for coming out. Times, New York Times. Thank all you. All right. Woo, 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 woo.